Hey everyone, welcome to God's Plan, Your Part, Year 2, where this year we're reading through and studying the entire New Testament, one chapter at a time. Thanks again for joining us in discovering God's plan and your part in it. Today we are reading over Matthew chapter 21, and this is certainly the beginning of the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. This would most likely be occurring, the things that we're reading would be occurring most likely on Sunday. Um, And by the next Sunday, Jesus will have risen from the dead. So we're looking at like the last four or five days of Jesus' existence uh, on the earth. I mean, I always have struggled with saying that because Jesus still exists. It's not like he stopped. So I think what's interesting since you brought that up is that chapter 21 is kind of, um, like you said, it's like this gateway into Jesus' crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection. So we're opening up with that triumphal entry, like what was what was prophesied about Jesus in the book of Isaiah. Uh, verse 5 says, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And so I just think it's, it's really interesting that we keep seeing these callbacks over and over to um, Old Testament prophets. But at the same time, when Ryan had mentioned this is like the week leading up to that point of his his crucifixion, we have about five more chapters Yeah, that is just like straight up Jesus taking advantage of every last yeah. moment, teaching, 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 like making a point of just about anything that he can. And the stuff that he teaches on, I feel like is so critical to the things that we believe, to the stories that we have learned about over our lifetimes. Um, and it's just, it's so cool to me how there is so much packed into this week that he still remained like true to his his mission until his death and then obviously that mission continued after his resurrection as well but i i think it's pretty cool to see how much is jam packed into these chapters these people had been hearing these prophecies mm-hmm. for many many years many many generations so they had their eyes peeled for somebody riding into town on a donkey actually in fact Jesus was not the only person to do this. There were other false messiahs who tried to do this. But mm-hmm. this is not like a, this is not Jesus coming in town and being like, oh, I need something to ride into town. Like, can somebody go get me a donkey? Like, this is like, he is making an open declaration through symbolism. I am the coming king. So we've seen people like profess real faith in Jesus and say, you are the son of God. You are the son of David. Here, Jesus is like pretty boldly declaring who he is. I'd like to think about what the people must have been considering, pondering if they were still on the fence at this point. Because in verse 8, it says, most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. So there have there has to have been that moment where they completely realized who he was. And like Im- imagining myself there, like there's a definite point where you just like you have to just like give in to it because mm-hmm. it's like, well, it doesn't make sense any other way. Mm-hmm. And like once you've like crossed that threshold, it must have been absolutely insane because of all the prophecies that had been foretold. And then finally here he is doing these things. And like it's it's not circumstantial at all that he is who he says mm-hmm. he is. And so I, I can imagine that feeling of like maybe total surprise, but also just like crazy anticipation just all coming together at the same point must have been absolutely nuts so think about the next step of his journey so the people that are praising him yeah they're saying like oh it's the coming king and their assumption is it's the coming king that will overthrow the political rule of the romans so does he ride into town to the antonia fortress where is like all where all the roman soldiers were housed no he goes to the temple instead and just wreaks havoc In the temple, which I think for the crowds would have been like, wait a minute. What's he doing? What's he doing? Like, those are those are our guys. Like, why isn't he fighting the bad guys? And he just goes nuts. So, like, this is a favorite story of mine. The people were there. The money changers were there to basically sell sacrifices to people who were on pilgrimage from far away. So Jews that had traveled, like you can't travel large distances with goats and sheep and cows. And so what you would do is you would convert your offerings into money. You would bring that money to the temple and you would buy offerings there. Not super scandalous. Um, And there will also be like foreigners who want to show faithfulness to God who would bring their money and convert it so that they could offer sacrifices to God. So like outsiders who wanted to honor God. But what's happening here is that these money changers jacked the rates way up. 
so that they could just get rich off of people's attempt to be faithful. This is why churches today should not exist to enrich themselves. So like I said, like it isn't necessarily just selling merch, but also um, you shouldn't really have religious leaders that are just trying to get richer and richer and richer. That's not really what we're supposed to be doing. And it seems like Jesus would have a problem with people who are trying to gain a profit um, from the people who are faithfully trying to honor God. And that's what's going on here with the turned temple tables. <laughs> and the den of robbers. Yeah, it's crazy what he says. I think it is worth saying that there are blind people that come to him, lame people that come to him in the temple, and Jesus heals them right there. Mm-hmm. And that is like a that would, mm-hmm. again, be like a big no-no in the the eyes of the the Pharisees, the chief priests, the scribes, all of that. Um, but when they do see what he has done, the, the chief priests and the scribes come up to him and they're just like, do you hear what these people are saying about you? Basically, they're not saying it in like a good way because people are still calling out Hosanna to the son of David, as seen in verse 15. Um, and Jesus comes back with, well, yeah, haven't you read what the scriptures say mm-hmm. about this? And he quotes back to, um, I believe it's a psalm. Yeah, Psalms 8, 2. It says, out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise. And so <clears throat> I think it is, again, it's a really cool way that Jesus kind of just stops these guys in their tracks by backing himself up with scripture of what was to be fulfilled by him. Keep in mind as well that Matthew's intent with writing this gospel is to convince Jewish people that yeah. Jesus is the true Messiah. So Matthew yeah. is over and over again using this these prophetic Citing passages to be like, look, there it is. Look, that's what happened. Look, mm-hmm. he is what he says. Um, so that's that's just another case of him doing it. And he's going to do it over and over. Um, there, there's so much left, and I want to try to well, keep the episode say, short. I feel like a lot of these <clears throat> these next couple parables that are coming up or even just like circumstances that come up in this chapter all talk about like a similar thread. You could probably look at all these stories, and this is a gross oversimplification, so please forgive me, but you could look at all these following stories from verse 18 all the way to the end of the chapter and say that Jesus is warning those people who would assume that they are just automatically in. Like -hmm. Jesus is saying to the religious people who don't actually have faith in God, who don't actually follow God, who just think that their religious identity um, without affections for God will allow them to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so mm-hmm. Jesus is going to do one thing after another to be like, no, that's not true. You need to come to God. No, that's not true. You need to be faithful to him and follow him. So the first thing that's going to happen is this really bizarre confrontation that Jesus has with the fig tree where like Jesus gets in a fight <laughs> with a fig tree for not having any fruit and basically says like, hey, like you, you've borne no fruit. Your time is over. What's important to understand about this is that in this time, the fig tree was the national symbol of uh, Israel. And so it'd be like Jesus walking up to a bald eagle and just chopping its head off. Like mm. you'd, you'd be like, oh, I think he's talking about America. Like they would have been like, oh, that's the national symbol of Israel. He's like accusing Israel of bearing no fruit. Mm-hmm. So I was actually a little bit confused when we were talking about the parable of the tenants. Uh, The parable of the two sons, I think, made a little bit more sense because, again, this thread is like if you have faith but no works or no actions to back yourself up, then it really doesn't mean anything. And this parable of two sons kind of hit home a little bit more in that one said, yeah, I'll do that. He was he did or he said he would do what he was asked, but it did. He didn't follow through with it. Um, whereas the other did what was asked of him and followed through. But the parable of the tenants was a little bit harder for me to grasp. Although they have the same thread, it was like, what is going on here? Okay, so again, just chasing this thread through, the fig tree is like a symbol of Israel, and Jesus is saying, you have not borne fruit, you're going to wither, your time is Mm -hmm. done. Then he's going to go into this story of the two sons, and the the issue with the two sons is one just outright says, no, I'm not going to do what you said but then changes his mind and does what he says. Mm. And the other one says, yes, I will follow you, but never, never but does never it. Does. Yeah, so so kind of like following that thread, he curses the fig tree because it hasn't borne fruit. That gets Israel's attention. Then he says, hey, the people that reject God, but change their minds and follow him, mm. they are actually doing the right thing. They mm-hmm. are better than the people who say they will follow him, but never do. It's like, it's like, Straight up rejection. Yes. Compared to living a life of basically just being fake. Like false allegiance. Yeah. So 
again, he says, listen, like the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they rejected God outright, but they changed their minds and now they follow God. They're going to be in the kingdom of heaven. You are not because mm-hmm. you keep saying that you worship God, but you don't. Mm-hmm. And that's a problem. Then, And I think that can get, can I say something about that? Because yes, I feel like may. that can be, <laughs> that can be slightly... Um, I guess like put out of context at times because I think there's like this thought that goes around too, where it's like, if you don't have a story of rejecting God outright, <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. Um, there's like this weird guilt that comes with it. Let like, oh my, maybe my faith isn't genuine. Maybe right. what I believe isn't to- like, it doesn't measure up. But I think that it's like, if it's that you are claiming to be something and you don't live a life that backs it up or you don't truly genuinely believe it, although you're putting on this really nice facade, that is more what it's talking about. I don't think it is requiring that you tr- exactly. straight up like, yes. I mean, we all reject God at some point in our in our lives. It's just a matter of like, when you say that you have committed to him, are you actually yes. or are you not? And I think that gets muddled sometimes because I think there's been a lot, at least I have even felt it too. Like, I don't know that I would necessarily say that there was like this time in my life where I was like totally like making X, Y, Z choices. And like, I have this totally brand, like I do have a brand new life in Christ, but it doesn't, it, I don't know that it would match completely with what this is saying. Right. And I think it, you have to be really careful with that because you can, if you are one of those people that has had a significant forget God, but now I'm in and then like kind of like judge others for not experiencing life the same way the, that the, can get the messy. key here is allegiance over appearance. Yeah. So like those who are faithful to Christ are in the kingdom of heaven. Those who say they are, but act like they aren't right. They're not right. those who reject. They're not those who reject and then change their minds they are mm-hmm. it reminds me a lot of the the parable we dealt with the other day um, where the the owner of the vineyard like pays the same wage to everyone regardless of how long they worked and it was a good yeah, wage like we yeah. see how faithful mm-hmm. god is and how gracious god is that he gives us a reward that we don't deserve so the issue here is like definitely you don't want to be in the camp of people who say they're christians but aren't Mm-hmm. And this would have stabbed right into the heart of the Pharisees. Like, it's like, hey, you hate tax collectors and prostitutes, but they're turning to the gospel mm-hmm. and you're not. Mm-hmm. So then he moves into this final parable in the chapter um, about this guy that owns a vineyard and like sets it all up and has it all prepared. And these tenants uh, just constantly take advantage of the owner of the vineyard. And the, oh. the vineyard like is like the vineyard owner sends people, continues to send people in. Um, to run the business and the people that he's sending in to run the business just keep getting killed. So Mm -hmm. like the representatives of the vineyard owner keep getting killed by the tenants. And so finally he's like, you know what? Like these guys don't listen to me. Maybe they'll listen to my son. And when his son goes in there, they murder his son. Mm -hmm. And the, the whole point, like this is the pinnacle of the point that Jesus is proving is like, I've been sending, God has been sending you prophet Prophet. after prophet after prophet and you destroyed them. The latest prophet that they destroyed is John John. the Baptist. Mm -hmm. Like over and over and over again, you killed the prophets. So what God is going to do one final time is send his own son to preach and speak to you so that you might listen to him. Mm -hmm. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to kill him. And what do you think he's going to do to you when you have murdered every one of his representatives and now murdered his son? Mm -hmm. So it's like if you follow like the crescendo of the chapter, it's like, hey, Israel, you better get this right because you're not producing <laughs> fruit. Hey, Israel, like you need to actually do what God says and love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. It seems like you're just saying you are, but you're not. Mm-hmm. Hey, Israel, actually, you've just been killing prophet after prophet after prophet. Now you have one last opportunity to accept my son. And if and you don't, it's it going to be bad. And yeah. we all know how it goes. So um, Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. The people would have understood the symbolism even more than we do today. Yeah, that's and so thinking. Jesus is just making this powerful, well, powerful example of what it means. Imagine how the disciples feel as they're hearing it, too. I bet yes. that was probably just like crushing. They're like, whoa, uh-huh. he just said and that? And think about Peter, too. Eventually, we'll get to the point where Peter actually rejects even knowing him. So, mm-hmm. oh, what a like super 
emotional, tumultuous time for these guys. <laughs> okay, but Peter specifically, and then we'll wrap this up. Peter specifically, yes, he denies Christ, but then he repents of denying mm-hmm, Christ and does mm-hmm. what Christ says. So Peter actually is a perfect example of this guy that says like, no, I don't know him, but then he changes his mind. Mm-hmm. Um, so the whole thing is just a reminder of God's incredible grace for his people. Guys, listen, the your part is we need to actually be the people that God calls us to be. God doesn't leave us with like tiny little bits of wiggle room where we can like look like we're serving the Lord on Sunday, um, but act however we want on Thursday. Like that's just not cool. It's not mm-hmm. permitted. Um, and if you are living a life like that, I hope that this message like cuts to your heart and you change your ways. Um, but also we should notice that God is gracious even to the people who outright deny him and eventually change their ways. Like that is amazing. God has so much mercy. We are probably dealing with people on a day-to-day basis who outright deny Christ, but will change their minds. Mm -hmm. And we need to have grace and mercy for those people so that we can celebrate their repentance. So that's kind of the your part for today. A little bit of a challenge. Um, Excited. We are excited about the next couple of days as we wrap up the the book of Matthew. Uh, And I hope you're excited too. We'll see you again tomorrow with Matthew 22. We'll see you then. Thanks for joining today's episode of God's Plan, Your Part. As always, please consider partnering with us as we are a listener-supported podcast that we hope to continue to grow with support from listeners just like you. We've made it super easy to partner with us, and you can support us by following the link in our show notes or our description. You can support us with as little as $3 a month. Every little bit of this helps so much, and we're so thankful for your support. With that in mind, here's today's reading. Matthew chapter 21. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them on their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And then the crowds went before him, and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, And the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read, Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive, if you have faith. And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say for man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, 
neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went into the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, The first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. Here another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally he sent his son, saying to them, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When, therefore, the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read it in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of God's Plan, Your Part. Don't forget, you can find us on just about every social media platform and YouTube. Let us know what you thought of today's episode. And if you have any questions, go ahead and post them there. You can also reach out to us directly at godsplanyourpart at gmail.com. As always, if you don't have a Bible or if you'd like to use the one that we use, Uh, Reach out to us via email and we'll be happy to send one to you. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you again tomorrow.